Okay, finally, uh, we want to interpret that analytic reconstruction formula. And uh, there will be some interesting consequences, which will also change the view of uh, that we have on our inverse problem. Okay, uh, first of all, let me remind you uh, what A of sigma actually was, how we defined it. That was defined as plus or minus k squared minus sigma squared when this over here is um, uh, positive or non-negative, so sigma squared smaller or equal to k squared and the other way around, uh, yeah. i times the other way around when sigma squared is larger than k squared. So in particular, we have that uh, this is imaginary whenever the absolute value of sigma is larger than the absolute value of than, than k. k is real. Uh, k is uh, taken to be positive. Okay, um, so what does that mean? Let's look at this term over here. There is an I, e to the i l a of sigma. Let's for a second assume that l is positive. Then um, we have the plus sign over here, and this is something like e to e to the i squared. So that's a minus sign, l times sigma squared minus k squared. So uh, that decays exponentially beyond k, right? So this is a term that decays exponentially beyond k. And also for the other way around, if L is now is smaller than zero, then L is smaller than zero. We have the minus sign over here, then minus L would be positive. We have the I square again. And uh, so this would de uh, again decay uh, exponentially. Okay, so, so what does that mean? That means that uh, this Fourier transform that we have over here, Almost, van van almost vanishes uh, as soon as we cross the border of K. So um, there are almost no scattered waves with frequency larger than K. This is something that can also very well be, um, there's a good physical reason for that. And uh, if they are almost not present, then we just simply cannot me uh, measure them. So, uh, Frankly, um, this can only be measured for absolute value of sigma smaller or equal to the absolute value of k. And uh, that means that uh, in all our formula over here, um, this part is never taken, but instead a is always real. Okay, uh, so uh, what does that mean for a reconstruction formula? That means that we can only plug in certain values of sigma over here. And uh, so uh, let's fix theta for a second and assume that RQ hat of theta and sigma was measured for that fixed theta and for all the absolute values of sigma smaller than k that are actually present and that can be measured. Well, of course, then we can compute the right-hand side over here. So taking all this to the other side, we can compute the Fourier transform of Q at the points, well, A of sigma minus K times theta plus sigma times theta perp. And uh, I plug in the definition of uh, A, and that means we can compute Q hat at the points square root of K square minus sigma squared minus K times theta plus sigma times theta perp. And that's now for L larger than zero, I'll consider the case L smaller than zero later. Now, uh, of course, I can write this as square root of K square minus sigma square times theta plus sigma times theta perp minus K times theta. Okay, now uh, this over here is a vector and its length would be K squared minus sigma squared plus sigma squared to the one half. So its length is always K. So that means that we can compute Q hat at most on a circle of radius K around minus K times theta, right? So this, because this is all, this is a vector of length K. So um, the, all the points where we can compute it um, have um, a distance K from minus K times theta. So they're on a circle of radius K around minus K times theta. Okay, which part of the circle can we actually compute? Well, um, 
in the drawing over here, let's assume that this over here is minus k times theta, we can compute on a circle of radius k around, my, uh, around this vector. So we can compute somewhere around here. And uh, so that's a, at most where we can compute uh, the Fourier transform. And uh, specifically, if I set sigma equal to zero, then um, I get the Fourier transform at, um, well, if sigma is zero, this is k times theta, minus k times theta is zero. So I get the Fourier transform over here at zero. And um, if uh, I set sigma equal to k, then this will be zero. I have k times theta perp minus k times theta. So this will be, I will be able to measure this point over here and of course all the points in between. And if I set sigma equal to minus k, well, same thing, I can measure, whoops. I can uh, measure on this part of the circle. So um, taking the values from sigma from minus k to k, I can measure the Fourier transform. I can, uh, I can compute the Fourier transform of the function q on this semicircle over here. And that's, uh, so uh, these are the points of uh, the, uh, of the semicircle, so the, of the circle where the absolute value of xi, the norm of xi is smaller than square root of two times k because the norm of this, these points over here is square root of two, a uh, square root of two times k. Okay, that was for the uh, for l larger than zero. Uh, now let's take l smaller than zero, and that should be somewhere here. And uh, the only thing that changes is that we get now get a minus sign over here, and uh, of course they're still on the same circle. Right, there's uh, all the points we can compute are still on a circle around minus k times theta with radius k. And, um, but now uh, if we set sigma equal to zero, we have that this is minus k, minus k, so this is minus 2k times theta. So we can compute, in this case, we can compute the Fourier transform at this point over here, the for sigma equals to k, same thing as before. I can uh, compute minus k times theta plus k times theta perp and minus k times theta perp. So if I let everything go from minus k to plus k, I can compute the Fourier transform of Q on this semicircle over here. And uh, that means I can compute the part of uh, the, the values of the Fourier transform on the part of the circle where norm of psi is of course, smaller than 2k because uh, 2k is the largest value over here. But on the other hand, it's larger than the square root of 2 times k. Okay, so for uh, the, that means that for the reflected wave, uh, and that's where L is smaller than zero, I can compute the Fourier transform on this semicircle. And for the transmitted wave, I can compute it over here. Okay, um, so uh, of course now you can rotate theta around and you immediately see that from the, um, um, you can, ah, and, and taking both measurements together, we can compute the whole circle. Rotating the circle around now with theta, we find that the Fourier transform of f can be computed, f of xi, um, f hat of psi can be computed for norm of psi smaller or equal to 2k. So there is a resolution limit of 2k. I can only, uh, I can only compute the Fourier transform of f of q, q, that should be a q, uh, in a certain range. And that range is also known as the diffraction limit. And uh, well, that's again, something that can be very well reasoned. There's a good physical reason for that, as I already said. Okay, so uh, when we use an incoming wave of frequency K uh, for uh, the, uh, as an incoming field, then uh, we can only derive the Fourier transform of that contrast function q 
uh, up to 2K, and that's something that's not very unusual. Okay, so uh, what we would like to do as a side note, we would like to choose K as large as we can. And uh, the problem is that then the waves are attenuated, which is something we didn't take into account at all in our wave equation. And uh, so then, um, so that's difficult. And uh, so you have to somehow find a way in between and normal ultrasound is just the way in between. Uh, and by the way, um, ultrasound, uh, as, the, it's, as it's used in the doctor's office, is, uh, I think, at one megahertz, I think. It's just so that uh, you expect to get a resolution of, of around one millimeter. And again, the higher uh, the higher the res the higher the frequency is, um, the uh, the better the images are, the, the more detailed the images are, with a restriction, and that's the restriction we'll now get to. In the case that only transmitted data is increased, the limit is square root of two times k, right? I mean, if we have only transmission measurements, we can only measure the left half of that semicircle. And that was, was the part where the Fourier where the coefficients of the Fourier transform were smaller than square root of two times k. So if we have only transmission data, uh, we cannot get, go, cannot get the full resolution, but we can only get to square root of two times k. But there's something that's even worse, because if only reflected data is measured, and remember, that is exactly the situation that we have with ultrasound and that we also have in geophysics. Only the frequency range from square root of 2k times 2k can be measured. Because the, the other half, I would for, for that I would have to measure the transmitted wave, and there's no way of doing that either with the Earth or with the human. So uh, the problem with that is I get a filtered image. I can not compute the low frequency range. And this is a major problem. The only thing that's visible in the image uh, finally is um, uh, co contrasts. So edges are visible, nothing else is. Uh, it's definitely not quantitative, so I cannot assign numbers to the image. And um, well, that is the situation, geophysics and normal ultrasound. And uh, so that's one reason why the images are not very good. But uh, of course, remember that in this case, we uh, simplified our situation a lot by looking at uh, the time independent problem, a time continuous problem. And of course, in geophysics and ultrasound, you usually have uh, the time dependent problem. But anyway, um, the same problems appear there as well. 